Thank you very much. Apologies for keeping you from lunch, especially because I don't have pretty pictures and um, uh, graphs to spice things up. What I'd uh, like to do in the next uh, 10 minutes, and I'll compress my talk because some of these aspects have been covered by Dr. Huck already. What I'd like to do in the next 10 minutes is to take you quickly through the legal character of the 1.5 degree goal and to look at some of the governance implications of the 1.5 degree goal. We've had numerous references and there have been snippets about the Paris Agreement in the last day and a half. What I'm trying to do here is to take you through the heart and guts of the Paris Agreement, so I hope that doesn't put you off your lunch. Uh, but in any case, what I'm looking at is primarily the governance implications in the context of the Paris Agreement, not the broader governance implications uh, in relation to international law more generally. And there are many areas of international law that are engaged, particularly by BECS and CCS and other such uh, sort of technologies. So to take you through the legal character of the 1.5 degree goal, uh, the Paris Agreement aims to, and then this is in Article 2 of the Paris Agreement, hold the increase in the global average temperature to well below two, two degrees above pre-industrial levels and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees. This is in Article 2, which is an operational provision in a legally binding instrument, in a treaty. So it is not just part of the preamble, it's not just context, it's actually in an operational provision. It reflects the purpose of the Paris Agreement, so in that sense it's very much the heart of the Paris Agreement, but it contains aspirational language. It aims to pursue efforts to limit, etc. So it is aspirational language, but it's very much the heart of the Paris Agreement, and it's the engine that drives the other, or should drive the other provisions, operational provisions of the agreement. It, Article 2, however, does lay out a context for implementation of this, of, of this uh, temperature goal. Now, two aspects to keep in mind in relation to the purpose of the Paris Agreement. It's not just the temperature goal. So the temperature goal is a very important part of it, and it's in Article 21A. But we also have Article 21B and 21C, which look at the finance and adaptation goals. Now, the finance and adaptation goals are actually qualitative. They're not quantitative in the way that the temperature goal is but nevertheless they exist. This, you know, the adaptation goal um, uh, captures an idea of resilient development and finance about making finance flows consistent with a low emission uh, greenhouse gas, uh, low greenhouse gas uh, pathway and climate resilient pathway. The second important thing to keep in mind about Article 2 is that it uh, does identify the context for implementation of the temperature goal and these other goals. And the context is sustainable development and poverty eradication, it's equity and common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities in light of different national circumstances, which was sort of a new qualification that's been added to the CBDRRC principle. The tonality of the provision is very much about harmonious achievement of the temperature goal with these other priorities, sustainable development and poverty eradication. Um, we heard yesterday about the win-win solution from Professor Xu, and that is the tonality of this provision. However, it's not unlikely that there might be some conflicts between these different objectives. Um, the Paris Agreement doesn't give you a solution to that. The framing of sustainable development and poverty eradication is interesting in the Framework Convention on Climate Change. The framing was one about overriding priorities. So developing countries, sustainable development, poverty eradication was an overriding priority for them. But in the context of the Paris Agreement, it's framed as a context for implementation. So it doesn't necessarily override uh, the climate objective. So what are the illustrative policy and perhaps model options in this context? You could have extensive support for developing countries, and this is what Professor Xu was suggesting yesterday, support in particular for the energy transition or you could have prescriptive burden sharing arrangements. This is what several developing countries have suggested and have suggested for years in the lead up to Paris. Uh, but the architecture of the Paris Agreement and uh, the nature of the obligations that are contained in it do not lend themselves to either extensive support, there isn't extensive support, and neither are, is there a prescriptive burden sharing arrangement. So that sort of takes me neatly to the architecture of the Paris Agreement and I think the governance implications of um, 1.5. And the question I'm trying to answer here or explore here is the extent to which the Paris Agreement, and in fact the hybrid architecture of the Paris Agreement, can actually deliver on the temperature goal, any temperature goal. So the hybrid architecture, by hybrid architecture I mean that it's a, it comprises a bottom-up element and several top-down elements. The bottom-up element is the nationally determined contributions from parties, 
And these nationally determined contributions, as you all know, are, is you know, the fundamental building block of the Paris Agreement. Now, by themselves, the nationally determined contributions won't get us where we need to go. So there are various top-down elements, what's been characterized in the negotiations as the ambition cycle. And I'll take you through each of these top-down elements uh, in a minute. So starting, up, starting with the bottom-up element, the nationally determined contributions, what legal obligations do we actually have with respect to these nationally determined contributions from parties? Um, the legal obligations that attach to nationally determined contributions are legal obligations of conduct. They are binding obligations, but they are obligations of conduct in that states have a binding obligation to prepare NDCs, to communicate NDCs, and to maintain NDCs. They do not have a legally binding obligation of result with respect to the content of their NDCs. So, the, so for instance, if the NDCs have um, targets and timetables, there's no legally binding obligation that parties actually achieve them. This was, of course, subject of huge debate in the lead, lead up to uh, Paris, but this was the political deal possible. The bottom up in this context may not add up, and as we know from various early indications, including the synthesis report from the Secretariat, it's not going to add up. We heard last uh, night that, it's, that we're on a 2.7 degree or more trajectory and not on a 1.5 degree trajectory. So we need strong top-down elements. What are these top-down elements, and what is this ambition cycle? The first element in the ambition cycle is a transparency framework, a framework that actually asks uh, states to produce information that clarifies these contributions that, they, that they've made to the Paris Agreement. Now, this is a very important sort of element because these the, this information and uh, this information is also subject to technical expert reviews and a multilateral consideration of progress. Much of this is going to be worked out in the post-Paris negotiations, but it's important because this information then feeds into the global stock take process that is also uh, referred to in one of the earlier sessions. So transparency is an important con uh, component of the top-down element or the ambition cycle. Another important element is progression. So there is an expectation that states, their nationally determined contributions are going to advance through every cycle. There's a requirement that parties actually produce these nationally determined contributions every five years, and there's an expectation that each successive contribution is going to be an advance in the previous one, and that it's going to reflect the party's highest possible ambition in relation to these individual nationally determined contributions. Apart from the fact that it's an expectation, the language is the you know, sort of pr predictive language of will rather than shall uh, in the text, but it's also unclear how progression is going to be determined. It's unclear how you're going to measure highest possible ambition. And uh, therefore, the default, or at least at the very least, there will be self-assessment by parties. There might be more, but there might be self-assessment by parties about what they're producing, whether it's and um, uh, it reflects their highest possible ambition, whether it's an advance on what they did in the previous cycle. The Lima decision asks parties to report on how they consider uh, their contributions are fair and ambitious. Um, but fair and ambitious is not just about, the, um, about what the Paris Agreement can do. They will, needless to say, as Benito said yesterday, there will be civil society reviews, and uh, there will be peer pressure that parties are, are actually progressing and uh, that their contributions reflect highest possible ambition. The global stock tick, a very key component of the top-down uh, sort of element of the uh, ambition cycle. So the global stock tick is, is required to assess uh, or is tasked with assessing the collective progress towards <coughs> achieving the purpose of the agreement and its long-term goals. The purpose, as you um, saw, includes not just the temperature goal but also <coughs> other goals, finance goals, and adaptation goals. And uh, the global stock take is comprehensive. It's looking at what parties are doing on adaptation. They're looking at what parties are doing on mitigation and on support. And it's required to take into account equity and science. Now, this has to be worked out. What does equity mean in this context? The fact that we have a reference to equity was a huge win for several developing countries, in particular the Africa group that had championed the equity reference framework for years in the negotiations. So this is a hook. We have to see how we actually flesh it out in the post-Paris negotiation. 
The most important element about the global stock take, as far as ambition is concerned, is that the outcome of the global stock take is meant to inform parties in updating and enhancing their nationally determined contributions. So this is an element that sort of connects us with the transparency framework and ambition, progression, and um, sort of successive contributions. Another element, and perhaps one of the last few elements of the ambition cycle, is long-term strategies. Again, this is not a phrase as a legal obligation in the agreement, but there's a recommendation that parties present long-term low greenhouse gas emission development strategies. Now, this, these sorts of strategies, the act of actually developing these strategies in countries may trigger strategic thinking about national development plans, about sectorial plans, about pathways, uh, and I think Professor Winkler is going to speak about this in his session in the afternoon. Um, and these plans may need to be broadly compatible with a well below 2 degrees or 1.5 degrees centigrade global pathway. A few final um, points on compliance. I can come back to this uh, later in conversation if there's any, anybody's interested. The details of the compliance system have still to be worked out. I would, uh, I would like uh, to spend maybe a minute or two talking about what if we miss the temperature goal, what can the Paris Agreement actually do? What, are the, uh, what recourse can we have under the Paris Agreement? So missing the temperature goal obviously has implications for adaptation. And um, again, this is something the Africa Group championed in the negotiations. The adaptation goal that we find in Article 7 is clearly tied to the temperature goal in that the adaptation response depends upon the temperature goal. If you're not, um, if you're not in line to meeting two well below 2 degrees or 1.5, then the adaptation response has to be that much stronger. Uh, there is support for vulnerable countries, and it's phrased as continuous and enhanced international support, which suggests that this obligation is dynamic. The more adaptation that's needed, the more support will be needed. However, the Paris Agreement does carefully circumscribe support obligations. Uh, for instance, if I just take one instance, and this is cross-cutting, support provisions are usually phrased in passive language. Support shall be provided to developing countries without actually suggesting who's going to provide the support. Um, so the global stock take then uh, also has specific requirements with respect to um, adaptation. It is meant to review adequacy of support for adaptation and also to enhance implementation of adaptation action. And uh, finally, implications for loss and damage, which, which uh, uh, Dr. Huck has already raised. Clearly, there are going to be huge implications for loss and damage uh, the higher the uh, uh, rise in temperature. And um, it was a huge win for the vulnerable countries. We have a separate article on loss and damage, and which means in particular that it goes beyond adaptation. It's not just about adaptation. It's actually about when adaptation fails, what you do when adaptation can't go far enough. And um, while it's not uh, substantively a very strong provision, and, and uh, Professor Winkler mentioned uh, the fact that there's no funding attached to loss and damage, and in fact, there's a provision in the, uh, in the COP decision that accompanies the Paris Agreement excluding any liability or compensation. Nevertheless, the obligations in the loss and damage provision uh, can be read as dynamic in that, uh, in that they, will need, they will need to be enhanced uh, and strengthened responses in the context of loss and damage if the temperature goal is not to be met. So finally, key messages on legal character it's an aspirational goal to be implemented in the context of equity, sustainable development, and poverty eradication, and not to the exclusion of those and not instead of those. On governance, the temperature goal has a benchmark setting function. It has implications for timing and scale of ambition of individual NDCs. And if the goal is missed, it will frame obligations relating to adaptation, loss and damage, and support needs, all of which can be perceived to be dynamic obligations based on uh, based on the temperature goal. However, um, and I don't want to end on a pessimistic note, but I think there are limits to which the hybrid architecture of the Paris Ag Agreement can deliver on a 1.5 degree goal, or any goal at all. And there are limits to which it can be done in an equitable fashion within the context of the Paris Agreement, given the limited and carefully circumscribed support obligations, and the fact there's no top-down determination of equity or fairness. Uh, I'm going to leave it there. Um, Thank you. Uh,